tonight I am actually going to do my absolute favorite presentation of all time, uh, this neighborhood's first discussion. That's about uh, my hometown. And it's funny because when I come to a place like Chattanooga, what I see is a, a, an endless amount of potential, just places like dripping with opportunity. Uh, I, I, it, it's great to come and look at it with fresh eyes because I, I think oftentimes as I'm walking around with people and as we're talking about things and, and looking at different maps and different designs and layouts and just looking at the trajectory of the community, I, I, I see like potential here that other people maybe sometimes don't because you live here every day, right? Like, you know uh, the disappointment that was this lot. You know where the bodies are buried over here. You know the, the bad city council decision that led to this and that. It, it's really good to step back and reflect uh, kind of afresh on your place from time to time because you'll realize and you'll grasp that it's a, it's a pretty special place. I live in a little town a couple hours north of Minneapolis, St. Paul. It's actually uh, the city where my great-great-grandparents uh, homesteaded a farm. Uh, I grew up there. I've lived there all my life. I, I left for college, but I came back. And uh, I'm very involved in our local government, very involved in the city, involved in the process, involved in the things going on. And so tonight we're going to talk a little bit about uh, one of the projects in my community and how it has impacted uh, the way that I view capital improvement projects. And, and hopefully there'll be some lessons here that you will find uh, familiar. This is my little town. Uh, if you've ever seen the movie Fargo, you've seen a, a not so flattering, but not so uh, inaccurate portrayal of my hometown. We don't talk like that. <laughs> at least not when other people are around. <laughs> we may uh, at family reunions, etc. cetera. Um, but this is, this is my hometown. Uh, I actually live right over here today. The farm I grew up on was right out here. Um, one day I woke up uh, and on the front page of the paper was an article saying that the legislature uh, was discussing a bill uh, to give the city money to run sewer and water out to the airport on the outskirts of town. Um, it was just a, 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 a bit in the paper. I have to say that my reaction to this was like, what the heck? What is going on here? I, I go to like a lot of the meetings. I'm on the city planning commission. I, uh, you know, am one of these guys who like reads the agenda and looks at the minutes. You know, I've read all the city's plans and ordinances. I know what's going on. I've never heard of this project here. Why is this being proposed? It was $7.1 million. Now, just for some, some context, uh, my entire city budget is $9 million. So this is a huge, huge project. I'm not saying that everything in the city has to go through me, but I should at least be aware of something this big when it's coming you know, down the road. Like, where did this come from? The local paper was kind of confused, too. The person who wrote the article was their stringer down at the, uh, down at the Capitol. The stringer writes for many, many different papers. Uh, so, you know, after it ran, the local reporter started to dig into it a little bit. Uh, they called our legislative delegation. Uh, we're represented by a DFL, so in Minnesota we don't have the Democratic Party. We have something called the Democrat Farm Labor Party. It's a long, complex history. Let's just say that we like to be different. Uh, we're represented by, in the House, John Ward, uh, who's a DFL. And then Carrie Rood is our senator. Uh, she is part of the Independent Republican Party. Again, don't ask. Um, <laughs> we just like to be a little bit different. Uh, so we called them and asked them, like, what, what, what is going on? You both proposed this legislation in your different bodies. Where, where did this come from? Uh, John, who's a really nice guy, uh, said, hey, I always listen to my constituents. This is what I was told you wanted. If this isn't what you want, let me know, and, and I'll take it out of the bill. Like, I got no problem with that, but this is what I was told you guys wanted. Um, they went over to Carrie, and Carrie, who's also a, a very nice person, I like her a lot, um, Carrie said, hey, uh, we've got to get this going in the committee. If we don't get this in uh, now, it can't go in later, like this is the deadline. We put this in, let's have a conversation. And if you decide that this isn't the project you want, we can always pull it back, we can always pull it out. It's kind of a dissatisfying series of answers. It doesn't really explain why this came about, right? So the newspaper finally ended up at City Hall. Hey, uh, what the heck is going on here? And the City Hall was kind of, you know, mum about it. They didn't have anything to say. They finally issued a press release. The press release said, 
uh, the fire marshal made us do it. Uh, we had recently done a project out at the airport, and I'm going to, this is why I started this by saying, when you look at your community fresh, uh, you see opportunity. When you live here, you get kind of bogged down. I'm gonna vent a little bit, because I have a hard time looking at my community uh, with open eyes sometimes, and I recognize that. Uh, out at our airport, we spent ungodly sums of money to uh, construct a jet bridge. You know, one of those things that come out when the, air, when the two airplanes a day land at the airport. <laughs> um, we also built a conference room and a restaurant. Uh, again, two airplanes a day, one at 6.30 in the morning, one at 11 at night. When they land, we have a restaurant. Um, <laughs> This construction prompted the fire marshal to come out and do an inspection and say, hey, you don't have enough firefighting capacity. Uh, if you have a fire, you don't have enough firefighting. You need more capacity. Now, I have the burden of being an engineer uh, and also reading English. So putting those two things together, uh, I understand that more firefighting capacity means we just need like a tank out there, right? A couple hundred thousand dollars could solve this problem. Um, the city staff looked at this, or the city and the staff, et cetera, looked at this as an opportunity to do a project they had wanted to do for a while, which is to run the sewer and water out to the airport. Uh, this would meet the fire marshal's requirement. Obviously, this is kind of silly. This is kind of overkill, right? We could solve this problem with a couple hundred thousand dollars. Why are we going to the legislature asking for seven million? Why are we coming up with this big project? And I started to voice this concern. Um, but then something you know, very predictable happened. In the coffee shops and the restaurants and the places where people gather to discuss, uh, the conversation started to shift a little bit. Things like, come on, Chuck, it's gonna create jobs. You know, we've got the highest unemployment in the state of Minnesota. Are you telling us you don't want these good construction jobs created here, Chuck? Come on. Um, you know, it's not gonna cost us anything. The legislature is going to pay for this. I mean, if we don't take the money, someone else is just going to get it. Like, why wouldn't we do this project, Chuck? Um, think of all the growth opportunity that's available here. Now we've got, you know, two miles of pipe out to the edge of town. There's hardly anything built out there. Think of all the things we can connect and develop. Think of all the land that's now got, you know, sewer and water utilities. This is a great deal, Chuck. And then, of course, uh, you know, think of the children, right? <laughs> I mean, are you smarter than the fire marshal? I mean, are you going to stand up and, 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 and oppose the fire marshal? So you get this kind of buzz happening in the community, in the coffee shops, and the different places where people gather. Of course, the legislature does appropriate some money, right? But do they give you everything you ask for? No. <laughs> They're not going to give you everything you ask for. They're going to give you just enough to where you got to reach a little bit beyond what your comfort level is to pay for it. So all of a sudden, the city, if they want this project, has a bill, right? Has, a, has, a, has a, a bunch of money that we have to come up with. Ouch, that kind of hurts. That kind of kills some of the momentum. But what happens then? Very predictable, right? We get all the uh, contractors, all the engineering companies, the local NGOs, the chamber, all like the pro-growth people step up and say, we need this project. We need to support our legislative delegation. They've sticking our neck out for us, put this money in the bill. We need to stand up and support them. We need to come up with this money and do our share. Look at the growth, look at the jobs. This is good for the area, good for the economy. Let's do it. And there you have the project development process, <laughs> right? And when the legislature does their magic, you have a, a funded project, right? That, that's it right there. I worked for city governments for a couple decades, and I can't tell you how many projects were put together exactly like this, or in a very similar way to this right here. What's the one thing that is missing from all of this? What's, what's the one group that is missing from all of this up to this point? The, the public, right? People, like us. We're no part of this conversation yet, but don't worry. We have a process for that. Uh, we're gonna hold a public hearing. We will give you three options, right? Uh, you can look at these options and decide which one you would like. Option number one, we will give you uh, a gold-plated pipe out to the, uh, the airport. It will cost a gazillion dollars. Option number two, we will do nothing and get fined uh, by you know, the fire marshal. 
Or we could do this nice compromise option that, oh, by the way, we've already got 90% funded by the state legislature. What say you public? And we wonder why people get ticked off, right? <laughs> we wonder why people get angry, feel out of touch, feel unrepresented, feel disenfranchised by the system. What we need to do is take this process here and do something radical. We need to invert it completely. We need to put it on its head. And we need to shift our focus as local governments from one that looks up the economic food chain to one that looks down, to one that looks up to try to collect as much as possible, to one that looks down in a model of service. Let's talk about what this looks like. And I'm gonna throw some of my friends under the bus here just briefly, <laughs> but I kinda have to do this. Um, there's a saying in Silicon Valley, and uh, because we're close to home here, I'm gonna emphasize that it, this does not speak to aptitude as much as it speaks to just the embodiment of an approach. There's a saying from Silicon Valley that goes, when we try to do innovation from the top down, it tends to be orderly but dumb. And when we try to do innovation from the bottom up, it tends to be chaotic but smart. Everybody in this room is gonna stand up and say, I prefer smart to dumb. But I'm gonna tell you, we have a massive, massive preference for order over chaos. We have such preference that we will sacrifice a lot of dumb. We will, we will, we will live with a lot of dumb in order to have order. And if you doubt me, think of the last time you sat at a traffic signal at one in the morning right? You will behave in a really dumb, mindless way because you believe in order, okay? Let me show you what this looks like from a government standpoint. And, and we, we all have these in our community. Yes, you are familiar with this project. The idea that we could create growth and development they have this big like moonshot project. If we did this and we could attract an NBA basketball team, uh, it would transform the community and, and, and transform this neighborhood and, and bring us all kinds of prosperity that has been elusive. I don't have to go into details of how this turned out. We all know that the Grizzlies, which are, I love the Grizzlies. I hate that you beat us so many times this year, despite being pathetic. Um, <laughs> We made, the, we made the playoffs on the last game of the season, and I blamed you, Memphis Grizzlies, for putting us in that position, because you should have thrown the games that you played against us. Uh, you didn't. You forced us to lose. Yeah, you did try. Um, let me give you a, a, another model, the, uh, another model from the city of Memphis. Uh, this is Broad Avenue. This one's not quite as famous as the Pyramid. Uh, but it's more impactful and it's more important and I think it's more relevant today to what we need to do to make our city strong and resilient. Uh, Broad Avenue is a little streetcar stop. Uh, back in, after World War II, the city ripped out the streetcar lines, uh, ran a highway through the middle of this neighborhood. Without the streetcar traffic, without people walking back and forth to the neighborhood, these blocks just died. Some residents out here, uh, sick of the decline and the neglect, took matters into their own hands, got the buildings swept out, got the sidewalks swept up. They painted their own crosswalks, painted their own bike lanes. They put up murals. They put up planters. They invited for a weekend some businesses to come in and open up and just show the neighborhood what this place could be like if somebody actually cared, if somebody actually, you know, wanted to make it better. This is not the best street in Memphis. It's not even close to the nicest street in Memphis but it's a heck of a lot better than what was there before they started. The pyramid, a couple hundred million dollars in subsidies, right? To turn it into a Bass Pro Shop now. After who knows how much money spent getting the site, building the building, all this stuff, having it sit empty for a decade and a half. This stuff on the right, after this project was done, the city's gone out and documented $15 million in investment, a 50% increase in rents, 25 new businesses, 29 properties uh, reclaimed, and 17 blighted properties now taken off the blighted list. Total public investment, zero. That's chaotic but smart. 
what we're starting to recognize after decades and decades and decades of growth being induced from the top down, we're starting to recognize that we're really, really good at building new stuff, but we're really horrible at making good use of it. We're really horrible at what financial people call the productivity. We can create a new product, we can't make it work well. We can create a new division, we can't make it function well. We can build something big, we're not really good at squeezing a lot of value and wealth out of it. We have been so obsessed with the dollar that we have overlooked the pennies, the nickels, and the dimes that are just laying there on the ground. And if we can shift our approach, what we see is that we can make very, very small investments and have a massive return for those investments. This ties into the way cities were built historically. For thousands and thousands of years, we can look at development patterns. And what we see is that cities were not built in, in big blocks. They were not built in large developments. I today went out and saw some of the places where you have old industrial sites where you're looking to have a single developer come in and make some magic happen with some big, huge investment in some area. And I actually heard people uh, say, if we fix this, it will transform this other neighborhood way over here. I'm like, why don't we go over to that other neighborhood now and start working on it? When we look at traditional development patterns, what we see is that cities were never built in big blocks. They were always built incrementally over time. Investments started small over time, and this is my hometown in 1870. Over time, little pop-up shacks, little tiny investments like this would transform into structures with more substance. This is actually the same exact street 30 years later. And after another 40 years of growing incrementally, growing incrementally out, growing incrementally up, and becoming incrementally more intense. Lots of small investments over a broad area, over a long period of time. Structures like this would become buildings of brick and granite. These are the exact, this is the exact same street another 40 years later. What we recognize is that the way we build wealth in a community is not by making large bets not by doing transformative moonshot projects, not by going to the casino and putting all our money on red. The way cities build wealth is by making small incremental investments across a broad area over a long period of time. Let me show you how productive this approach is. These are two identical blocks. The one on the left I've labeled old and blighted, the one on the right I've labeled shiny and new. If you look at them, you'll see they're the same size area, the same amount of public infrastructure, same thoroughfare, same neighborhood. Everything's the same except for the style of development. That old and blighted block looks like this. And if you think about a city growing incrementally, in the 1920s as my city was uh, growing incrementally out, <coughs> the next three blocks of investment would have been just like this. Those little pop-up shacks. This is the cheapest investment you would have built on the far outside of town in the 1920s. Had history continued the way it had for thousands of years, what would we have expected? We would have expected it to grow over time, second and third stories, the buildings to become more intense, more ornate. That's not what happened. Uh, after these were built, we had the Depression, we had World War II, then we had a completely new style of development that just skipped right over this and started building out on the edge. These buildings have stagnated for 90 years. Two blocks over used to look just like this. We got it torn down, and now we have a new Taco John's drive through Has anyone here ever been to Taco John's? Please. Carrie, you've been to Taco John's? Where at? No way. You've been to Taco John's? Where at? Wisconsin. Yeah. <laughs> Iowa. There you go. So Taco John's is, uh, I'm sorry you don't have it. Authentic Mexican food. Um, <laughs> it's kind of known for, and I hope you partook in the potato oles, yes. So a potato ole is a uh, tater tot, like cut in half, a half a tater tot, uh, with spice on it, Minnesota spice, so not too hot, uh, dipped in cheddar cheese. Just like they do in Mexico, right? <laughs> 
So we were really excited to get Taco John's, right? It met the zoning code. It met the or, you know, all, the, all the sign ordinances and parking requirements. We got rid of the on-street parking so the cars can flow through. We got some you know, native plants in the stormwater area. Everybody was thrilled about this, right? We got rid of blight. Here's what nobody bothered to look at. That old blighted rundown block had a total value of $1.1 million. That shiny new block, the same size area, the same amount of public infrastructure, just a different style of development, is only worth 600000 The city is actually collecting 78% more property tax from that old rundown junkie block than that shiny new one. Understand what you're looking at. You're looking at the traditional pattern of development, the way we have built cities for thousands of years around the world. You're looking at it in its infant stage after 90 years of neglect, and it still outperforms by a wide margin the stuff we build brand new today. If this seems counterintuitive to you, I invite you to go to our website and look at example after example after example of this style of development. I'm gonna show you now on a big macro scale what this looks like on a citywide basis. Um, this is a study we did in Lafayette, Louisiana. And I'm gonna preface this by saying, uh, when we do this kind of thing, we work in uh, accounting terms. So if you are in the red, you are losing money. If you are in the green, you are making money. Uh, everyone on our team putting this map together sees red and green. 2% uh, of the population does not. I did not realize that when this map was put together. So I'm going to come up here on stage and walk you through this. Um, this is a map of the city of Lafayette. Uh, those of you who do see red and green, um, where you see green, what you're seeing are properties that uh, pay more taxes to the city than they cost to provide service and maintenance to. What we did is we went out and, and we looked at every single source of revenue the city had. We mapped them all up. Here's where they get their sales tax, their property tax, their utility fees. We looked at every expense the city had uh, and we mapped those up. Here's where your sewer, here's what that costs, here's where your water system is, here's what that costs to maintain. Uh, here's your roads and your sidewalks. Then when we got done, we mashed all those maps together and came up with this profit and loss map, essentially. Everywhere you see green, the city is bringing in more money than they're spending. Everywhere you see red, it's the opposite. They are committed to spend more money than they are scheduled to bring in. The higher the line goes, the wider that disparity. Let me walk you through this. There's a green spike right here above my hand that goes off the screen. That's a green spike. That is a new urbanist development on the edge of the downtown. Um, by new urbanist, what I mean is a development built with uh, traditional design standards with modern finance. So everything is built with like tight blocks, narrow streets, but it's built all at once to a finished state, not incrementally over time. Um, when we look at developments that are built like this, they tend to perform really, really well initially. Uh, this is a really like, high return kind of investment initially. The problem that we see, and this is consistent with all post-World War II development, where we build all at once to a finished state, uh, without any type of succession plan, uh, without anything more that the properties can become, like a single family home can't become a duplex, a duplex can't become a quad unit. The zoning essentially fixes what we have at what we have. There's no evolution plan for this neighborhood. What we see is that 25 years after the initial construction, everybody's roof fails at the same time. Everybody's driveway goes bad at the same time. Everybody's siding needs to be repainted at the same time. Everybody's appliances fail at the same time. They were all built at the same time. They all have the same lifespan. They all fail at the same time. Without the ability uh, to have that staggered, if you built incrementally, without the ability to have properties in distress renewed to a higher level of intensity, what we see is that these places tend to go into decline. And there might be a, a, a time where they hang on a little bit, but what happens is that people who are affluent see the decline, see the starting signals of decline, and they move to somewhere else. And the neighborhoods get locked into kind of terminal decline. This is the pattern of suburbanization that we see everywhere across the country. This is how we have built all developments post-World War II. Right now, today, doing fantastic. It's an open question how it will do in the future. 
To the east of that, so to the right as you're looking at it, this area here is all green. This is Lafayette's core downtown. Um, Lafayette would kill to have your downtown. Your downtown um, has a lot of missing teeth. You've done a lot of damage to yourself, but what is left, a lot of it is really spectacular. There's a lot of really good stuff left. And I'm sure you lament the things that you lost. You remember what that was and like, oh my gosh, I wish we still had that. As someone walking in without that knowledge, without that kind of backdrop, uh, who doesn't have like to lament what was lost, I look at it and I see nothing but opportunity and potential. Lafayette, Louisiana would kill to have your downtown. Their downtown struggles. Uh, there's a lot of like one and two story buildings, a lot of them that are, are lacking tenants. Uh, they've made some investments there, it's getting better, but it, it's not doing that great from the eye candy test. Financially, it's doing awesome. It's the, it's the backbone of the community. There's an arc of green that runs through here from about down here up to here. This is all green. What is that? That's the uh, poor neighborhood in town. That's the neighborhood where the poorest people live. That's the neighborhood where when we were going there to work for a week and we're gonna get an Airbnb, the city staff said, mm, don't go to that neighborhood. That's where the homicides happen, the burglaries happen, just stay away from there. That's, that's the poor people. Everything else on this map is red. All this stuff down here is red, all this up here is red, all that up there and over here, this is all red. Um, those are the big box stores, the malls, the, uh, the, the, the strip malls, the franchise restaurants, the, the, the windy subdivisions with the dead end cul-de-sacs, that, that's all that stuff out there. If you are the median family living in Lafayette, Louisiana today, you pay $1,500 in taxes to the city. You pay other taxes to the, the school and the county or whatever, but 1,500 to the city. In order for the city to make good on every promise represented on this map, in order for them to maintain every road and street and sidewalk, curb, uh, you know, pipe, pump, valve, meter, all that stuff, in order to provide all the police and fire protection, maintain the parks, all this stuff, median family taxes would need to go from 1,500 a year to 9,200 a year. One out of every $5 a family makes would need to get sent back to the city just to maintain what they have today. That's not gonna happen. That's never going to happen. In fact, Lafayette already today is, is being crushed by maintenance costs for all this stuff out here that is coming due that they just don't have the money to fix. This is what we see in every city across this country. Every single city in North America because we all have copied the same exact style of development. There's a city that is way further along this than Lafayette. Lafayette is now faced with a decision. What neighborhoods do we maintain? What neighborhoods do we let go? What road do we fix? What road do we allow to fall apart? What pipe do we replace? What pipe do we give up on? There's a city that's way down this path, way, way down this path, has had to deal with this now for a couple of decades. What city am I talking about? Detroit, Detroit right? I go around the country and I talk to places and people uh, always have a narrative about Detroit. They always have a way to explain Detroit. If you're on the left side of the political spectrum, you have a, 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 a coherent narrative, an internally coherent narrative about Detroit. If you're on the right side of the political spectrum, you have an internally coherent narrative. There's very little overlap of those two. The only real overlap of those two narratives is one observation. We are not Detroit. Everybody is convinced, like, we are not Detroit. Detroit is somehow vastly different than us in some strange way. We are not Detroit. Let me give you my uh, explanation of what's gone on in Detroit. When we look at the early 1900s, and we look at Detroit becoming the motor city, uh, what we see is that Detroit was the very first city to experiment uh, with the auto commuter. Uh, they were the first ones to run the highways through the middle of the city. They were the first ones to tear down buildings, to build parking lots. They were the first ones to have workers work outside uh, or live outside on the edge of the city in, in homes and commute in every day and then commute back out at the end of the day. They were the first ones to really extend out further and further and further. And 
When we hit the Great Depression and cities started to go into collapse, started to hemorrhage, uh, you know, it, during that depression, uh, what we saw is that the city of Detroit actually did pretty well. And grading on a curve, it did spectacular. By the time we got to the end of World War II, one thing was very clear to policymakers and to people around the country. If we wanted to experience prosperity, if we wanted to capture the innovation that the automobile represented, if we wanted to not have all those people returning from war uh, just slide back into depression and unemployment, what we needed to do was copy the development model of Detroit. And that's what we all did. Detroit's not some crazy anomaly. They're just 20 years ahead of everybody else. They just started this 20 years early. They're just early, right? So we have some deep, deep, deep structural issues that we're gonna have to deal with in the coming generation. In order to do this, and in order to make good strategic investments today, we have to change our uh, investment mentality. I showed you how we go about doing public investments today. We actually need to develop kind of a split personality in terms of our investment. We need to develop the personality of both a banker and a venture capitalist as two kind of separate entities. How do bankers invest? Banking, and, and, and don't think of like Wall Street banks, which really are not banks, they're investment houses and they're weird things, but think of like your local bank. Local banking is an incredibly conservative undertaking. You only invest in things that are guaranteed not to lose you money. If you get a loan from a local bank, what do they require from you? Collateral, equity, skin in the game, right? A relationship. There's a saying that if you need a loan from a bank, you're not gonna get a loan. The only people who really get a loan are the people who don't actually have to have it, right? Um, there's a saying uh, also that describes the local banking industry. Uh, it's the 363 principle. Uh, you borrow money at 3%, you lend money at 6%, and you get out on the golf course by 3 p.m. <laughs> That's the business model. And it's very, at its heart, very conservative. How is that different than a venture capital mindset? A venture capital mindset, the idea is that um, I have extra money so I have money I can afford to lose. I want to have that money grow. There's a bunch of different ventures that could pay off. I don't really know which one will. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna sprinkle money a bunch, a bunch of different things that I think have potential, knowing, knowing that of these, say, 10 things I invest in, five of them are gonna fail completely. Two or three of them may like break even or do okay, but one or two of them are gonna to go to the moon. They're gonna turn out to be so fantastic that not only am I gonna make all my money back from the ones I lost, but I'm gonna make way, way more than that. That's a venture capital mentality. On Wall Street, there's an investment strategy called the barbell strategy. And it's really interesting because the more I've gotten to understand this, uh, the more I've realized that this is just the way smart people invest. If when we invest, and I'm, I'm saying we non-smart people, uh, and I'm talking about in the Wall Street vernacular. We're considered Muppets in the Wall Street vernacular. We're the suckers at the card table. When you go to a local broker to open an account, the SEC requires them to go through a bunch of questions with you. What do those questions ask you? They're trying to gauge your level of risk, right? And every single question focuses you in on what? I want medium risk. I don't want to bury my money in the backyard. I don't want to go to the casino and do the roulette table. I just want a medium amount of risk. Not too risky, not buried under the, you know, I, I want to be in the middle. And in Wall Street vernacular, you're called the sucker. Because what you have is all the downside exposure. Like your portfolio can go to zero. Everything in your portfolio can fail and you can lose all your money. But you have very limited upside. You don't have anything in there that's really going to go to the moon. Savvy investors try to capture both the conservativeness of a banker and the upside of the venture capitalist by splitting their portfolio into two. I'm gonna have most of what I have in very conservative, very low risk, low return kind of investments. And I'm gonna put a very small percentage in things that can go really, really high. In other words, uh, I'm gonna put a floor on how much I can lose. 
in this scenario, 95.5, I'm never gonna lose more than 5%. If everything goes to hell over here, the worst I'm gonna end up with is 95% of what I got, right? So what you do here is you limit your downside exposure while you maximize your upside potential. Think about this as a city. Think about this as if you were a city wanting to do this. Where is your banker investments? Where, where are your banker investments? Where's this stuff here? We're gonna go back a second. Oh, not here, we're gonna go to here. Where are your banker investments? Your ones where you're guaranteed to not lose money. Yeah, look at where they are. And what do these investments look like? Maintain the street, maintain the sidewalk, keep the street lights on, keep the grass mowed, keep the park maintained. This poor neighborhood here should never want for maintenance. Why? Because they're paying the freight for the city. That's your banker investment. It's actually just doing the meat and potatoes to take care of what is there today. Where's your venture capital investment? That's what we're gonna talk about next. So when I did that uh, Taco John's analysis and uh, I published that on our website, um, it started to get passed around my hometown and people became very angry with me. <laughs> um, my uh, cousin runs the local economic development authority that put the deal together. Uh, I've got another cousin who runs the, is a manager at the Taco John's. Um, <laughs> yeah, uh, family reunions can be awkward. Um, so the pushback that I got was, okay, Chuck, you're so smart. You think you know everything. What would you have done differently? Taco John's comes to town. They want to tear down this whole block, put in the new Taco John's. What, what would you have done differently, Mr. Smart Guy? And I struggled with this for a long time because I looked at it as a transaction. And what it took me a while to realize was that to answer the question properly, I needed to reject the premise. The premise was this neighborhood is in terminal decline. Someone wants to invest something in it. Why would you say no to that? And what I realized we needed to say no to was the decline part. We should not be accepting decline as normal. And so what we did, and we being myself and, and a bunch of my friends in this neighborhood who are kind of of like mind, we spent a year working in the neighborhood with the Taco John. So I'm gonna give you a little orientation. Taco John sits right there, right down there. That old and blighted block is right there. My office is right here looking out at that actually. And my house is actually right over here. So this is the neighborhood next to mine, uh, a very poor kind of distressed neighborhood. Um, we, we spent a year out in this neighborhood, um, walking the streets, uh, biking out there. We would go out there on lunch. Sometimes we would go set up like a table in a parking spot and just work out there and like watch people throughout the day. Um, we uh, just tried to understand what was going on in the neighborhood. What we, what we did is we tried to observe people and observe where people were struggling to live in this neighborhood. And then we would go out and we would try different things. Uh, we saw like a, a lady, uh, older lady uh, uh, walking down the street with a walker, climbing over the mounds of snow. Why are you walking in the middle of the street? Well, there's, there's no sidewalk here. Uh, I've got to get to the pharmacy today. Um, we saw the, the mom pushing the stroller uh, through the ditch, weeds up to her waist. What are you doing? Well, I, I have to um, uh, get to the grocery store. Uh, I don't have a car today. It doesn't feel safe on the street, so I'm, I'm walking here. We started to document these things, and we started to go out and try like different interventions. When we were told that uh, kids were not allowed to walk on one street because the cars went too fast, uh, we went out and did a speed study, and we said, yeah, yeah, they do drive way too fast here. Uh, then we went out and we took chalk and, and narrowed up, drew some narrower lanes in, and did another speed study and found we could slow traffic dramatically. Uh, we started to do different things out there to see what, what, what did people respond to, what actually worked to, uh, to turn you know, this neighborhood from where it is today to make it a little bit better for people to live there. 
Uh, at the end of this all, we came up with eight projects, um, eight projects that we recommended to the city. Here's those eight projects, and I'm going to give you like a quick orientation of this neighborhood so you know what you're looking at. I said the Taco John's is right down here, Old and Blighted Block. Here's the neighborhood school, um, just some history. My kids just graduated. My old youngest just left there last year. It was her last year. Um, I went to that school. My mom went to that school. My grandma went to that school. So that's the neighborhood school right there. Um, here is the mall. This is the old mall, we call this, because there, of course, is a new mall way, way out here. Uh, but that's the old mall. That was the mall that killed the downtown. The new mall killed the old mall. So, um, <laughs> yeah, this has, you know, like really kind of low value stuff. But it has a grocery store on the end right here. The grocery store used to be here. That one's now empty, but the grocery store moved here. That was economic development. Um, up here is the park in the neighborhood, okay? Up there's the park. And then we have kind of identified these two paths here are kind of like the, the through fare of the neighborhood, the, the, the thoroughfares in a sense. Um, there's a state highway down here and then a county road through here. So let me show you these eight projects. Um, this is the first one right here. This is what the street looks like. So this was the street that the kids were not supposed to go down because the cars went too fast. And in fact, when we looked at the street section, what we saw is that not only was there no striping, it just feels like two, you know, 22-foot lanes here. The cars just fly down this thing. Um, but, uh, you know, without any striping at all, uh, it was really, even if you had striping, they would be 14-foot, you know, really wide highway-style lanes through here. So what we said is, let's just get some paint. This is where we did the experiment, and we actually found we could slow the cars a lot by just having narrower lanes. Let's get some paint out here, and you know, let's draw in some narrower lanes. You can use that space for bikes. You can just make it a buffer or whatever you want to do. But let's just you know, narrow up the lanes, create some edge friction here. Slow vehicles down. Here's uh, the street perpendicular to that. Uh, sometimes when I show this, people get all excited. They're like, wow, your city has light rail. Um, no, we have an abandoned rail line. Uh, they don't have a, 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 an icon for abandoned rail line in the program. So it looks like a light rail. Uh, this is the line out to the old uh, business park that's abandoned now, and the line is abandoned, but we haven't dug it up. So what happens here is that you have uh, these 24-foot wide driving lanes on each side. This is a huge drag strip. And at the end of this street is that old and blighted block, right? We'd like to get people from the neighborhood able to walk there and take part in that block. Arriving to that place by car is actually not very helpful. Where most of their traffic is going to come from is from the neighborhood. How can we make this a little bit easier to walk? We said, let's go in and let's paint some park. Let's narrow up the driving lanes. Let's paint some parking lanes next to them. And then let's create some space on the edge of the street that we designate for biking and walking. There's no sidewalks at all here. So let's just give people like a safe space to walk. There's a little bit of paint to designate where that is. Here's uh, one of the crossings over by the grocery store. Um, we noticed a lot of people walking through here. The traffic on foot in the neighborhood kind of funnels through these two spots to get to the grocery store. The cross traffic here is very fast. One of the things we noticed at the grocery store is that they use this cross hatching stuff to kind of signify to the people driving that you need to go slow here because people are walking. We said, let's just take that cross hatching concept and try it out here to uh, kind of just slow things down a little bit in this intersection. Uh, block south of there is another one of these crossings, very fast cross traffic. You can see these wide curve radiuses here. When the cars come flying around here, we actually saw people walking along here uh, dive into the ditch. Um, just because, you know, the cars come flying really fast. Uh, these are wide commercial streets because they're supposed to have on-street parking, but of course there's all this unused off-street parking, so it's kind of redundant. What we said is let's uh, put a crosswalk in to help people get across. We actually did one of those in the middle of the night with duct tape, uh, and it made a big difference. Uh, we also uh, said on the other side of the street then, let's put in a double uh, white line and just give up like the top, the, the northern 10 feet of this as a designated place for people to bike and walk. You're still going to have two really wide lanes. Uh, but if we can give people like a little refuge on the one side, it would make people who are making that trip a little bit easier. Um, the park on the north side of town uh, from the neighborhood looks like this. This is the view from the neighborhood to the park. 
Uh, the park was having, uh, let's say, nefarious activity going on. Uh, the city wanted to try to stop this. The police department was recommending cameras. Uh, we recommended tree trimming. Um, <laughs> if you could actually see in the park, the idea is that uh, it would improve the view or the value of the properties of the people uh, who live there, and it would also make the park a uh, more open, kind of safer place to be. When you get on the other side of the trees, here's what the park uh, looks like. Um, it is rather neglected. In the time we spent in this neighborhood, outside of organized sporting events, so a softball game planned for the evening, uh, we never saw anybody in this park. No kids ever went to this park during the day just to spontaneously play. This park is empty, empty, empty. What we said is, uh, we can't fix this. Like, I can't make the maintenance people go out and take care of it. I can't do any of that. But what can we do right now? Well, we could go out and plant some trees. We could plant a bunch of seedlings in the outfield and kind of create like a start of a forest out here to buffer from that abandoned industrial site. We could put up some trees in here so people could someday, you know, not tomorrow, but maybe five years from now, six years from now, sit in the shade and watch a softball game. We could start to put in like little things in place to make this better at some point in the future. Let's, build, let's do what we can now and start to build some momentum. Um, this is my favorite. This is, uh, as we were spending time in this neighborhood, the one thing we noticed was that there was one street in particular that really had what we thought uh, was a lot of just natural upside potential. Uh, as we were on this street, and this happened to be the street that the old streetcar line did run through, we had a Every city had a streetcar at some point. We had one line that went through, and it happened to go down this street. And you can see this street has, like, great bones. It's got a great, like, layout. The buildings line up really nicely. They orient towards the street, so they're kind of, from a security standpoint and a neighborhood standpoint, they're very neighborhood-friendly. They don't put the garage out front. They don't turn around and face the back. They all face the street. Um, you can see that there's nice sidewalks on the side, nice boulevard. It's got really good spacing. There's only one thing that, from a layout standpoint, this street is really missing. In the late 80s, we had Dutch elm disease go through and wipe out a high percentage of the trees. The city has never put those back, largely because the maintenance people don't like them. Uh, I don't care. Uh, I want to put those trees back. What we found is that um, we found a number of studies, and I'm going to quote one, from Portland, but I will preface it by saying Portland is a weird, strange place. I'm not suggesting Chattanooga is Portland or my town is Portland, but I do think it's very interesting. What they found in Portland was that for every street tree uh, on a street, the property values were $9,000 greater. So from street to street, yeah, it's like the cheapest investment you can make. Even if it turns out to be $900 in my town, a street tree costs like 50 bucks to get planted and get going. We said, let's go out. We want 75 of these on the street. Let's get them planted and fill in these gaps. So there's our eight projects, those venture capitalist projects. The idea being, if we can go out there and make these little improvements uh, that, that, that respond to where we saw people struggle, where we saw potential in this neighborhood, where we saw things that we could do that were small that could turn this neighborhood in a different direction, that we would signal to people in the same way they did in Broad Avenue in Memphis that somebody cares about this place, that this place is not just going to be in terminal decline, that we can actually turn things around. Now, I started this presentation by giving you the $7 million sewer and water project. Uh, that project just completed last fall. The final cost, after all the change orders and all the contracts and all that, was $13.5 million you understand where the difference came from, right? So that's part of our water bills now for the next 35 years or something like that. Um, the cost of our eight projects here, $16,700. What happens if we go out in this neighborhood and we spend $16,700 trying to make it a little bit better, trying to respond to the hardships that we saw people have. What if we do this kind of investment and nothing comes of it? Nobody in the community looks at this neighborhood and says, wow, this place is, is, is not you know, a, a hopeless cause. I, I, can, I would like to invest in this neighborhood. More importantly, what if the people living there 
uh, who rationally know that if they spend $5,000, $10,000 fixing up their house, that that's a lost investment. They'll never get that back. Oftentimes we look at neighborhoods that are in poverty and we conclude, and I say we, society, we, uh, we conclude that somehow those people don't care about the place. They have less pride of ownership, less pride of place. They're somehow lesser people because the places aren't maintained as well. We think that that somehow signifies that when reality, it signifies that there's just smart. If you live in a neighborhood in decline and it's gonna cost you $5,000 to reside your house or $10,000 to re-roof your house, are you gonna spend that money? You're never gonna get it back. You're just gonna throw it away because your neighborhood is in decline. These are not dumb people, these are smart people. They know what makes sense. What if we signal to the neighborhood that, hey, this place does not have to be in terminal decline. This can go a different way. How much capital will we get off the sidelines? But what if we do that and nothing happens? What if we go out and we make these investments, we, we, we put time and energy in, we humble ourselves to go out and say, we don't know the answer, but we are going to actually observe where people struggle and then try to address that concern with the next smallest thing we can do. What if we do that and nothing good comes of it? This is venture capital money. We're out $16,700. We can afford to lose that. That's not a big deal. Next year, we go back and we try eight more things. And the year after we try eight more, and the year after we try eight more. This is truly a way that we can start to, as a city, make low risk, high upside investments that make our balance sheet fuller, make our neighborhoods more prosperous and wealthy, and in the process, improve the quality of life for the people who live there. That's what a strong town strategy is. That's what we as people want to do. What it takes is for us to recognize that instead of, and I can't remember the quote at the very beginning, uh, I want, Instead of uh, four buildings of 12 stories, I want 12 buildings of one story. Instead of one project of $7 million, I want thousands of projects of small amounts to seed things, to get things moving. It starts with the humility to recognize that you don't know what the right answer is. But if you can iterate it, if you can try things, if you can try little things and scale what works, we can get back to that incremental development process that has proven over thousands of years to be financially strong and resilient. Cities have the capability of providing something for everybody only because and only when they're built by everybody. We've got to get back to co-creating our neighborhoods. We've got to get back to working from the bottom up. We have to get back to making small, low-risk, high-return investments. And if we do that, not only can we make our city financially strong and resilient and healthy, but we will improve people's lives in the process. Thank you so much for having me here tonight. <laughs>